Good morning, uh, my name is Richard Timpson and I'm a solicitor up here in Brisbane in Queensland and I'm presenting a paper to you today on what are known as public interest criteria and those are essentially criteria contained within the migration legislation which regulate um, to a large degree in the public interest the assessment in terms of a non-citizen's capacity to enter and stay in Australia. So I have done up a paper for the purposes of my presentation today. Um, it's about 40 pages in total and I'll scroll through the paper as we proceed. Um, I'm working off multiple screens today so if you see me looking from left to right it's essentially because I'm sort of navigating and controlling the PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, if you do have any questions in terms of my presentation, um, I'm more than happy to take those at the end of this discussion. And also, um, I understand Legal Wilds will release a copy of my paper to you directly. And as you'll see on the paper on the front page that I've got open in front of you at the moment, there is also my email address. So if you have any questions, I guess, following uh, you watching of this event, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have um, in that regard. Okay, so I guess then moving on um, and directly into the presentation today, I want to speak about public interest criteria. And these are really relevant because from my experience and in my practice, I come across, I guess, time and time again, situations where clients, for example, have made applications and they obtain adverse decisions on the basis of they're not being able to satisfy public interest criteria. So what I had thought about in terms of presenting this topic to you today was that I would explain in a general sense what the concept of public interest criteria are, where they're located, and how best to assess them in terms of your practice so that you can get optimal outcomes for your clients in representing them um, in this area, but also from a risk management point of view and a management perspective as well. So that if you have a client that has, you know, maybe some issues in that regard, um, you're able to foresee and manage the issue as best as possible. Okay, so I guess without further ado, I'll get straight into the paper. And I just want to talk in a general sense, firstly, around what actually is um, in the public interest and what does it mean? Well, on the first slide, um, I've put down some um, words in relation to what in a general sense does um, in the public interest actually mean. And what it means is it's not really closely or very specifically defined, definitely not in migration legislation, but it is a concept that really runs back and has been running really since ancient times where the concept of the public interest refers to government decision making as being important and having an effect towards the orderly um, and I guess well-being of a particular society and that's a concept that has developed you know really strongly over the years in, in many different jurisdictions and, and particularly in the Australian immigration jurisdiction and what we have in our Australian immigration jurisdiction is specific criteria that are created that require decision makers to consider applicants against matters that are viewed to be in the public interest. So in an overall general sense, these requirements are contained within Schedule 4 of the Migration Regulations 1994. And if you open up that schedule, you will see there's a long list of various um, specifically stated public interest criteria that go to a whole range of things. So, you know, I guess what I will do um, later on in this discussion is to talk specifically around each of the requirements that are contained within Schedule 4 so that you understand them um, when they apply and how they can be problematic. But in a general sense, I do want to talk around why they're there. So from an immigration perspective, the, the intention of Parliament around inserting these requirements is that they place additional requirements on a visa applicant to satisfy certain matters because the intention of Parliament around their creation was that or is that um, it needs to be in the public interest for persons to stay or enter Australia in certain respects. So in that regard, what we have is criteria created around applicants' health, criteria created around applicants' 
character uh, criteria created around applicants, previous immigration history, and whether or not, for example, they've been engaged in fraudulent activity around making visa applications, amongst a range of a whole other things as well. So the, the view generally from a parliamentary perspective in terms of the creation of these requirements is that it doesn't think that it's in the public interest of Australia to allow non-citizens to enter in circumstances where they might have a health condition, where, for example, they may owe money to the Australian government, where, for example, there may be a significant issue in terms of their character. So with reference to that, a whole range of criteria have been designed and implemented into the regulations to require departmental decision makers to have reference to what Parliament's intention is in that regard. Okay, so I guess in a general sense, that's why they're there and what they seek to pick up. Now, where they're located, as I've said previously, is within Schedule 4 of the regulations. Now, Schedule 4, once you open it, you'll see, you know, there's a long list of, you know, a whole range of different public interest criteria. Now, it's, it's really, really important to note that when you're looking at Schedule 4, it's not that everything in Schedule 4 is relevant to every visa applicant as such. So what you need to do is um, you, you will need to have a look at Schedule 2 as well. So um, you'll be aware that in terms of the requirements for most visas, those are contained within Schedule 2 of the Migration Regulations 1994. Um, and for each specific visa, there's a part within Schedule 2 that refers to the substantive requirements. Now, in terms of each part in Schedule 2, it specifically references the applicable public interest criteria in Schedule 4. So what that means essentially is that the department, in terms of their assessment of the visa applicant, can only assess a visa applicant under public interest grounds in terms of what are specifically stated within that part of Schedule 2. So it's important, I guess, just as a matter of practice, that if you're looking at a client situation in terms of assessing them, you know, not just in terms of public interest criteria, but also on other grounds that you have Schedule 2 open and then beside it, you know, perhaps on another screen or on a separate page, you have the relevant Schedule 4 open as well. And as you read through it, and I'm going to go through a case study with you in a second to show you how to do this, um, you'll see reference to certain public interest criteria mentioned in Schedule 2. So as soon as you see those, you'll then jump across to Schedule 4 and you'll have a look specifically at what the criterion is in Schedule 4 that's relevant to your client. And this is really important because it gives you a sense then of what you need to face um, in terms of the particular applicant. Um, so look, on, on top of that, there's a few other things I think that are important for you to understand. And that's, in a general sense, public interest criteria will apply to most visa subclasses. Um, most of them, I think if not all of them, relate to criteria or circumstances to be satisfied at the time of decision. So in other words, they're assessed by the department at the time they come to make a decision on the application. Now, from a risk management point of view, as much as that's the case, it's important for you in terms of taking instructions from a client that you establish their capacity to meet, you know, not just all of the other substantive requirements, but also definitely the public interest uh, criteria that apply in each particular case as well. The reason why it's important is that the creation of the public interest criteria that apply to the particular circumstances have to be assessed by the departmental decision maker. And if the client doesn't have a capacity to meet the requirements, the application has to fail. So, you know, sometimes as I'll go through with you in a second, you'll see circumstances that arise post application that couldn't have been foreseen from a public interest criteria perspective. Um, and those, I guess can, will need to be managed as best you can in the circumstances, but you will have other circumstances where through detailed and proper investigative work in terms of taking instructions from your client, you'll be able to establish, you know, whether or not this particular criteria is at play or, 
you know, whether it could be an issue down the track in terms of the department's assessment of a client's particular circumstances. And, you know, to give you a sense of like what could happen, you could have a meeting with a client, for example, where they present at your office and they give you, you know, a comprehensive set of instructions concerning, you know, perhaps their immigration history, perhaps their employment um, and skills-based history, um, you know, the composition of their family unit, amongst other things. Um, you, you may even take instructions from them concerning their health and character, like which is always recommended. Um, but you might find that for the purposes of the department's assessment, for example, against the question of health, they will assess that through the prism of a medical examination, which is usually conducted post-application. So it can often be the case that unbeknownst to a client, there's a health issue, they attend at a medical appointment and then something comes up in that, which then can be problematic in terms of their ability to meet visa requirements. Um, the same sort of thing can also happen in terms of the question of character. So in terms of the question of character, what we can see is where um, old matters or matters that the client didn't think were relevant come up in post-application police clearance checking and then you could have a situation where there's a pre-application conviction which wasn't disclosed and that could be highly problematic in terms of certain public interest criteria to find that we didn't disclose this, we could have or should have disclosed it had the client given you proper instructions or you taken this. So it's always important to be as investigative and as, as really as probing as possible with the client in terms of establishing everything that you need to know in terms of the overall mix now, I'm going to go to a case study in a minute for you, which will give you a sense of the practical sort of implementation of the public interest criteria and how to read the legislation as best you can um, and to understand and fully apply it. But it's, it's really important to note that these public interest criteria, they apply not just to these applicants themselves, they also apply to family unit members of these applicants. And it can be the case that these criteria apply both to applicant members of family unit and also non-applicant members of family unit. So I guess in terms of each of the visas, it's different in the sense that um, uh, like the construction of the legislation for each visa is different in terms of whether or not a public interest criteria applies to all parties or you know, specific cohort of applicants within an application. Um, and the legislation is really prescriptive about that, but it's important for you just to be aware that if you have an applicant and just one applicant, it might not just be that applicant that's assessed against these criteria. You need to understand who else could be assessed against the criteria. And if there are other parties that are going to be assessed, you need to take instructions on whether or not the background of that person could be problematic in terms of their ability to meet the criteria as well, because as we'll see in the case study um, in a few minutes, it can be a situation where, for example, a primary visa applicant and even, you know, members of their family unit are able to meet requirements in terms of public interest criteria, but because of the way the legislation is worded, a non-applicant party in certain circumstances call, can also cause the whole thing to fail for everyone, even though they're not an applicant. So I guess we just wouldn't want to have a situation where, for example, you proceeded with an application and everything seemed fine in terms of a primary applicant and a secondary applicant's ability to satisfy, you know, whatever they needed to meet in terms of public interest criteria to find then that there was an issue in terms of the third party. So I, I guess preparation and understanding of legislation is always key to every aspect of law, but particularly this one, and the legislation will tell you specifically who is going to be assessed against these requirements in terms of whether it be an applicant, a secondary applicant, or a non-party applicant. Um, so it's, yeah, really super important to understand that. So I, I guess then um, it's probably a really good time and opportunity for us to have a look at a case study. Now, the, the case study I've done is just simply um, an iteration of a specific piece of legislation as it relates to a particular visa type for a primary applicant. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And the next slide in this case relates to 
um, a subclass H20 visa applicant. So a, a subclass H20 visa is a temporary onshore partner visa. Um, so it's for someone, for example, that's in a de facto partner or a spousal relationship with an Australian or permanent resident partner. Now, um, because of the length of the legislation, in part A20, I haven't put all of it in there, but I just put in the part of the legislation that relates to public interest criteria going to a primary applicant's um, assessment against those criteria, just to give you an example of how a primary applicant is captured by public interest criteria, but also how a secondary applicant and a non-party applicant could also affect or infect the overall applicant's um, prospects of success as, as such. So if you have a look at the case study in front of you, you'll see in the first part of that, in brackets one, it says the applicant um, subject to subclause two satisfies public interest criteria 4001, 4002, 4003, 4004, 4007 and 4009. So when you see something like this, it's always a really good exercise to stop. Have schedule four open on another screen or beside you and then go to each of those particular public interest criteria and, and look at them, fully understand them and see what they say. And then in terms of instructions taken from your client, understand whether or not this particular criterion is going to be problematic. So the, the structure of Schedule 4 is that in part one of Schedule 4, you'll have a long list of numbered public interest criterion. Each of them commence with um, the number four, and then you work down through it. So in this case, 4001 is the first um, public interest criterion that you come to. And as you scroll down, you'll see it specifically stated as 4002, 4003, 4007, etc. So just, just looking at the wording here in front of us, um, so 4002, 4002, 2003, those are all criteria that go in an overall sense to an applicant's character. 4007, 4004 relates um, to the question of um, debts to the Commonwealth, 4007 relates to an applicant's health and so forth. Now, what's really interesting about like how this is constructed is if you have a look then at the subclause below, which is subclause 820.244, you'll see there that it refers to each member of the family unit of the applicant who is an applicant for a subclass. 820 visa is a person who, and separately then, there's public interest criteria that the secondary applicant will need to satisfy. But you'll know from looking at part 20 that a secondary applicant's criteria are actually listed further down in the document. And what happens is that how they're embedded here like this means that where the secondary applicant is unable to satisfy these requirements in their own right, it will also cause, because of how they're placed within the primary requirements, the primary applicant's capacity to, to get a visa as well. So in other words, in a situation like this, where there's a secondary applicant for an A20 visa um, and they don't meet these specific requirements, it will cause the whole application to fail. So, you know, as you can see, it's really, really important that you take detailed instructions from the client because you just don't want to have a situation where, for example, there's a member of the family unit that's included in an overall application group um, and it, where that one person may have issues you know for example in terms of their character or their health it could cause the whole thing to fail so it's important that you're really sort of probative in terms of your taking instructions so that you can foresee as best you can any issues in terms of the overall mix in terms of an applicant's capacity to meet these requirements okay so i just want to move along to the next slide um, and you'll see there in 1A is just a specific legislative example of a circumstance where a non-applicant party's capacity to meet these requirements can also cause a primary applicant's application. And then it follows the rest of the party's applications to fail as well. So you'll see there, there the way it's worded. It says, each member of the family unit of an applicant who is not an applicant for a subclass H20 visa is a person who, and then they need to satisfy specific um, and discrete public interest criteria. So it's 
it's, it's sometimes hard to believe that a non-applicant and their ability or inability to meet requirements could affect a visa applicant, but it, it could. It's, it's unfortunately not designed to be fair. It's designed in a sense to foresee problems down the track in terms of that other person coming into Australia in due course and sort of meeting that off of the past sooner rather than later, as such is my view about it. But it's, it's just an example, really more than anything of, um, I guess, being fully investigative in terms of the client's instructions and, and fully understanding what it is that you need to, you know, satisfy by way of requirements for a visa because it will allow you from a risk management perspective to deal with the matter and that there would be really no surprises down the track and to manage, I guess, clients' expectations where there could be an issue as well. Okay, so I guess um, moving on then from the case study, I do want to just get into the individual public interest criteria themselves. Now, when you get into Schedule 4 and start making applications for visas, you'll see that there is really like a multiplicity of these criteria listed in Part 1 of Schedule 4. Um, in terms of my discussion with you today, I'm going to go through each of them um, as best I can and give you an overall sense of what they mean and what they require and I guess provide some examples around sort of, you know, prob problematic issues that I've had and dealt with for clients in terms of dealing with these things. Um, for many of these criteria, and particularly in relation to the question of health, particularly in relation to the question of character and certainly in terms of the question of you know fraud in visa applications um to be honest these you know are probably deserving of you know a day or two of cpd in themselves so like in terms of the time that we really need to spend on each of those ones i don't think i can really do it serious justice in the time that i have but i'll certainly do my best in terms of giving you an overall sense of what the re these requirements are so that when you come up against it for the first time you'll understand hang on this is something i really need to be looking at because it could be problematic in terms of a client okay so i guess with that in mind uh, i want to talk firstly then about the, the first listed public interest criterion in schedule four of the regulations what we have is what's known as public interest criterion 4001 now this is you know really huge in terms of the department's consideration of these applications it needs to be read in conjunction with section 501 of the migration act so essentially the operation of um, section 501 applies to all of these applications and requires the minister to be satisfied that an applicant for a visa essentially is of good character okay now that requirement is also um, specifically sort of dropped into public interest criteria 4001 as an additional measure that allows this assessment to take place um, it's important to understand that even if you don't see public interest criteria in 4001 listed in the relevant part of Schedule 2, um, the view the department takes is that Section 501 of the Act applies in any event to all of these applications. So in other words, um, even if PIC 4001 doesn't feature in Schedule 2 and you're looking at it, the department will still carry out an assessment of an applicant's character under Section 501 of the Act. Okay, so look, in a general sense, from a visa applicant perspective, um, the, the question of an applicant's character is really significant, actually. Um, the reason for that is that an applicant for a visa, there's an onus on them to satisfy the minister that they pass what's known as the character test. So, when you're looking at a client's character, what you need to understand is that um, you need to look at public interest criteria in 4001, but also definitely Section 501 of the Migration Act. So Section 501 of the Migration Act contains a whole range of different measures, but particularly in relation to these applications, um, we have a capacity for the minister to refuse a visa application on grounds of an applicant's character as such. Now it's important to, to really look at Section 501 closely, but particularly the definition of what is the character test in Section 501. So the character test is really, really broad, and I do want to spend some time talking about it here today because you know it's one of those things that you'll see time and time again in terms of you know bringing 
these applications for clients and assessing clients from the perspective of, you know, their previous history. And, you know, I think one of the, the, the big things that I see in terms of misunderstandings is that, like, the, the departments or the ministry's assessment in terms of an applicant's character isn't just focused on whether there's been criminal offending the definition of the character test is actually really broad and it encompasses, you know, also potentially at their civil conduct. It, it also looks at things like a person's association with other groups and persons as well in terms of whether they've been involved in criminality. So I think a really good starting point in terms of assessing any client in terms of the operation of public interest criteria in 4001 is to have a look on a sort of deep dive date basis with section 501 of the act um, in most cases what you'll see as being problematic in terms of the character test is really the definition of whether or not a client has what's known as a substantial criminal record and again that's separately defined in section 501 and it's generally where someone has been sentenced to a term of imprisonment um, of 12 months or more and in those circumstances they um, will fail the character test now it's really important to note but in terms of how Section um, 501 operates and how PIC 4001 is worded, is that even if someone fails the character test, there's still a discretion to be exercised by the decision maker within the department or the minister themselves in terms of whether or not to grant them a visa. So if you have a situation where um, you've got a client who has problematic offending in terms of the definition of the character test, it doesn't mean that the application will be refused. It just increases the risk that it could happen. So in those circumstances, like you'd be definitely taking detailed histories from the client in relation to the nature of the offending in question and to, to also looking at, you know, whatever the sentencing outcomes were. And, you know, I think the client's overall history in that respect is really, really important because, you know, matters like the offending was quite old or like matters in terms of the client's rehabilitation since any offending is all really important. All of that sort of material will go into the overall mix in terms of the department's consideration of an applicant on character grounds. So um, I guess it sort of goes back to the question of getting full instructions from a client. The clients will definitely be really well advised to be open and frank with you in terms of providing instructions on their character because there's really no merit whatsoever in trying to hide anything from you or from the department um, in a situation like this. I mean, the reality is that um, the department will request penal clearances from overseas, from Australia, from the perspective of assessing clients um, character. So if there are matters which the, the client is hoping that the minister will not discover, the reality is that they will. And, you know, time and time again, I've seen situations where um, clients haven't been forthcoming in terms of previous offending. And then, you know, needless to say, the offending comes up in overseas or Australian Federal Police clearances. And then we have a much bigger problem where the non-disclosure can then cause a problem in terms of another public interest criteria and applications can be refused and on that basis and you know that's a real tragedy when that happens I mean the reality is that an applicant must provide correct information on his application by withholding something like that it can also be a criminal offence but the offending when it's not disclosed can often be quite minor and had it been disclosed it might be the case that the you know the conduct itself didn't warrant an adverse finding in terms of the character test, but the, the non-disclosure of it um, is actually more problematic than, you know, often the nature of the offending itself. So I think clients really need to be forthcoming in terms of instructions to you. You certainly need to be forthcoming in terms of your probing of, you know, their past and, and talking around if they came before the courts previously, were they involved in any conduct that could be problematic previously, so that you fully understand what the picture looks like in terms of the question of their character okay um character is certainly becoming more and more of an issue in terms of these applications uh, particularly under the current government and 
it's important to understand that, you know, even where there's been significant history, notwithstanding the government's position, that it is still possible, depending on all of the circumstances for visas to be granted. So I think it's important and goes to the importance of, you know, why full instruction should be taken so that ultimately you're able to articulate a position on behalf of the client as to why they should be allowed to enter or remain in the circumstances. Okay, so look, that's the question of character. I guess beside it, we will also have, just going to the next slides, public interest criteria in 4002, 4003, and 4003 a I'm just through those last three ones, going to briefly skim through them and talk to them. The reason is ultimately that I think they definitely need to be looked at and grouped in the same context as public interest criteria in 4001. Um, the reality is, though, it's really seldom that you will ever see any of those latter three um, criteria employed by the government. Essentially, they relate to determinations on national security grounds by, say, ASIO, by, say, the foreign minister, um, in terms of persons involved in problematic activities overseas in terms of things like, you know, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, to be honest with you, it'll be really seldom that you will ever come across these, but nonetheless, they're there for a reason. They're there to give, I guess, the federal government additional reason and grounds to refuse applications um, in specific circumstances relating essentially to national security as such. Okay, um, so I guess then moving on from that, I want to talk about public interest criteria in 4004 because um, it is definitely one that I see the department creating problems for clients time and time again on. Now, when I say the department creating problems for clients, is that ultimately the client has caused the problem themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Public interest criteria in 4004 relates to a circumstance where it's viewed to be in the public interest that a visa should not be granted, where there is a debt owed to the Commonwealth. Now, in terms of how that's drafted, it could pretty much be any debt, but the practical reality in terms of how it's implemented by the department is that it relates to debt to the Department of Home Affairs as such. So I guess you know, similar to character, um, you would be asking the client about their previous immigration history. Where someone had a debt to the Commonwealth, it will generally mean that they've had a previous history of stay in Australia and for some reason that money is owed to the Department of Home Affairs. Now, in terms of my practice and my experience, um, most of the time that I see it occurring is that where an applicant party has been involved in some sort of interaction with the Department of Home Affairs previously, mainly involved in litigation, where a debt to the Commonwealth has effectively you know, crystallized. So um, the most sort of frequent iteration, if you like, of that is where um, an applicant may have brought an application by way of judicial review of an adverse administrative appeals tribunal decision um, and failed in that litigation. So, like it's generally the case in terms of that type of litigation, that costs will follow the event. So, where an applicant is unsuccessful before the courts, they'll be exposed to paying in order for costs to the Commonwealth. And obviously, you know, the more litigation that they're involved with in terms of that decision, whether it proceeds to an appeal, um, will obviously increase the amount of debt due by way of cost orders if they're unsuccessful with that. So, you know, you can have a situation where someone has been involved in multiple, you know, litigation right up to, you know, for example, especially the application to the High Court, where there's a whole range of accumulated debt to the Commonwealth as a result of that action. So I guess how it operates is that the government says that it's in the public interest, that someone looking to get back in or someone looking to stay where this criterion applies should not be allowed to do so unless that debt, that debt is paid, which I guess, you know, in one sense is fair enough. Now, it's important to note that it's, it, it either needs to be paid off or arrangements need to be entered into in terms of it being paid off. So I guess how it could trip you up is that where a client hadn't been fully forthcoming in relation to their previous immigration history and the fact that they were involved in litigation before the courts, but um, that litigation failed. And they, like they may, in fairness to them, not have been aware that orders for costs were made against them. Um, and usually what happens is you make the application, 
um, this doesn't come up as an issue until I guess close to the time of the decision where the department will you know raise it with you at that point um, you know it's always better to be proactive and foresee these things and that can be done really by taking detailed and sort of probative um, instructions from a client as such but uh, I guess where there is a debt and the debt can't be paid or that arrangements haven't been entered into the department has to refuse the application where this criterion applies so certainly be aware of it and it mainly goes to an applicant previously being in Australia and interacting with home affairs in the fashion that they're owed money somehow as a consequence of their interaction. Um, so it's important. It's used with increasing frequency. Um, so definitely one where you should be putting into some form of a pre-consultation checklist in terms of the things that you should be discussing with your client. Okay, so I wanna focus next then on the health criteria because you know I guess besides character, um, and certainly in my experience, the question of an applicant's health is really something which in terms of, I guess, the department's reasons for refusing applications on public interest grounds, definitely health is up there amongst the frequency of those sort of decisions. So in that regard, um, in Schedule 4, we essentially have two public interest criteria going to an applicant's health. Um, so this is public interest criterion 4005 and we also have public interest criterion 4007 as well. Now um, it's, it's really important to understand that in terms of the applicant circumstances that you're facing, are you facing a visa affected by public interest criterion 4005 or is it 4007? Because as I'll discuss with you in a second, um, it's very significant in terms of the difference of those two criteria in terms of an applicant's capacity to meet requirements. And you know, it, it may be the case, and I'll talk about this in a second for you, that where you have an applicant and you've done a risk assessment in terms of their ability to meet this requirement, and you're looking at a visa that's solely affected by public interest criteria in 4005 that it might be the case that it's sensible for you to steer them towards an arrangement if they can meet the requirements of that different arrangement that has a visa um, requirement public interest criteria in 4007 instead. Um, so I guess what I mean by that is that public interest criteria in 4005 and public interest criteria in 4007 have essentially the same substantive requirements from a health perspective. So essentially what the, the parliament or the, the, the legislature has intended is that it's set out requirements that from the public interest point of view, <clears throat> an applicant will not be allowed to enter Australia in circumstances where they have active tuberculosis. That exists across um, PIC 4005 and 4007. The second one is, is that where an applicant um, has a disease of a highly communicable or infectious nature. So needless to say, the government doesn't want, in circumstances like that, someone coming in that would put the population here at risk. And thirdly then, we have a situation that's embedded across PIC 4005 and 4007, where the department essentially has to assess an applicant on the basis that where they have a disease or a condition, would someone, um, of the same disease and condition require medical treatment, healthcare, community services, that would put the Australian taxpayer to significant cost. So how it's designed is really interesting and sometimes difficult from an applicant's perspective to meet the requirements is that they don't assess the individual applicant's circumstances against the requirement. They take a hypothetical person with the same condition and then assess that hypothetical person against the requirements. So it's refusals on this ground are not because the person has a health condition. It's on the basis of the cost associated with the treatment of that health condition. And again, the, the thinking behind it is, well, um, you know, does the country need in the public interest applicants, visa holders coming into Australia with health conditions that will put a significant burden on the public health system in Australia. And the view generally is that it doesn't, and I guess public interest criteria in 2005 and seven reflect this. So I guess that's where it sort of starts and finishes in terms of PIC 4005 and seven. 
What's really interesting, though, is the difference between 4007 and 4005. 4005 is black and white, really, so you need to either meet those requirements or you can't. With 4007, there's scope for the, the minister, essentially, to disregard the fact that someone can't meet health requirements. Um, and that goes to their overall circumstances, you know, in terms of things like the capacity financially to mitigate the cost in terms of, you know, what benefit will accrue to the country in terms of the person coming in here, amongst a whole range of other considerations. But I think it's really important just to go back to that point that I was raising previously, that where you have a client that you can reasonably anticipate that there will be a problem from a health perspective in terms of the costings. Now, when I say in terms of the costings, um, the, the legislation in terms of 4005 and 4007 doesn't define what significant cost is, but from a practical perspective, it's around $50,000. And that $50,000 is generally assessed over the period of time that the visa is intended to be granted for, or if it's a permanent visa, 10 years. So, you know, you can imagine, um, for example, an applicant with HIV, for example. So in those circumstances, um, you know, whilst, you know, gladly the, the treatment is really effective now for that condition, the cost of the medication is really, really significant. You know, so if you're assessing an applicant um, over a 10 year period, um, it's generally always the case that for such an applicant or a hypothetical person with the same condition, the treatment costs would be well in excess of $50,000. And, you know, often it can be up around five, dollars $600,000, which is well and above the relevant threshold. So clearly, if you have an applicant that is looking to come into Australia um, and has a condition that you think or through evidence that you'll obtain, would be in excess of $50,000, you'd probably be well advised to be looking at what other visa options might be open for this person that doesn't have PIC 4005 um, for them to be assessed against because um, there's a much more sort of arbitrary consideration in terms of public interest criteria in 4005 over 4007. And I should say that in terms of 4005 and 4007, <clears throat> under the way the regulations are formulated, um, the assessment in that regard is carried out by what's known as a medical officer of the Commonwealth. So essentially it's a doctor in the employment of home affairs and the minister has to take as being correct that person's opinion for these purposes. So um, in other words, it's very difficult that in those circumstances, unless you've got medical evidence to the contrary to persuade a medical officer of the, of the Commonwealth that, um, you know, they meet public interest criteria in 2005 or they don't. Now, where PRC 4007 is open to you, um, it's still the case that whether or not someone can get through PRC 4007 comes down to the exercise of discretion by the decision maker in terms of whether or not they should waive the requirements. So, you know, as much as you're steering a client potentially towards a PRC 4007 um, arrangement in, in a circumstance of a significant health condition, it's still the case that it is a discretionary consideration. So obviously you would need to make sure that you manage their expectations and any risk in terms of it not working at the same time. Okay, so I guess like that's health in a general sense. Health is, is super important. You will come across it more or less in every visa application where an applicant is assessed. Like often you'll have conversations with clients around, you know, what's everyone's health like? And, you know, there, there can be situations where, um, you know, family groups in all honesty say everything is fine and you know usually an applicant will not um, be required to undergo a medical assessment until close to the decision and you can have situations where people you know go through medical assessments and unfortunately and surprisingly to them find out that there is something there that they didn't know about and in those circumstances it can be devastating you know for them personally and um, unfortunately but also for the applicant um, in terms of their prospects for the visa that they've applied for when there is an issue in terms of health. So I think it's, it's always better to be proactive about these things. And, you know, it can be the case that you do medical assessments pre-application as well. And where there may be a concern about it, it can be advisable to look at getting medical done beforehand. But it, again, it depends on the circumstances. Okay, so I guess then moving on from the public interest criteria and going to health, I want to talk next. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through to the next part of the document. Um, to public interest criterion 4009 
and 4010. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to dwell significantly long on them, um, but I, I do think that in terms of their existence in the legislation, um, they will generally apply to a lot of the permanent um, visa applications sort of on the books. Um, now, the department, in my experience, and I think this is reflected in their own policy, will seldom use these criteria in terms of assessing an applicant. What they essentially do is that they require an applicant to have an intention towards permanent residence in Australia. Now you think, you know, that would make sense where they're applying for a permanent visa, but I guess what it's intended to do is to knock out someone um, in terms of their contention where they might say, well, actually, I just want the visa. I'm going to take off and live somewhere else, you know. So um, it, it does give them the ability to refuse applications where there isn't that in intention. Um, also, the legislation is designed to, I guess, have people coming in where they've got a capacity to support themselves when they come in as well. And, um, you know, the, the requirements are very, very sort of specific on that. Um, as I've said previously, I don't see a lot of refusals um, under PRC um, sort of establishment uh, grounds, but I think it's there. It's certainly something to be aware of. And I think in reality, it's something that we will see more of in years to come in terms of the department using this as a measure to knock applications back. Okay, so I guess moving on then from there, we have um, another public interest criterion called 4011. Now this one's really interesting, in my opinion. Um, it sort of appeared more or less out of nowhere, maybe about four to five years ago. It essentially applies to um, visitor visa applications. And what it does, it's not a mandatory refusal where someone isn't able to satisfy it. So it's quite interesting in that respect. But what it does is that it creates an, a risk profile for someone where they have a specific immigration history. So as to require that person to, I guess, hire, to, to meet, uh, excuse me, higher evidentiary requirements um, where they've sort of fallen within that sort of risk matrix as such. And <clears throat> what, what it does essentially is that where someone has a previous history of making a permanent visa application to Australia within the last five years, it requires that person then um, to, I guess, go through additional hoops in terms of proving whether or not they're genuinely seeking to come in on a temporary basis. And I guess, <clears throat> you know, reading between the lines with it, um, it's created to stop an applicant that's failed previously to come in permanently to coming in on a temporary basis then and bringing another permanent application here and failing. Um, so I guess that's the intention behind it and it puts applicants through sort of a much higher set of standards in terms of what they need to satisfy and decision makers will need to have regard <clears throat> to a whole range of you know factors concerning the applicant's background um, their country of origin, their age, and matters like that. Um, to be honest with you, there's scope within Schedule 2 for the department to look at that consideration anyway, but the existence of it as a Schedule 4 requirement just gives the department really additional teeth in which to assess applicants and unfortunately refuse them as well. Okay, um, so I guess then moving on from there, we have public interest criteria in 4012 and 4012A, these ones really relate to applicants under 18. You will generally see it, for example, on visitor visa <clears throat> arrangements where what it requires the department to do is that in circumstances where a minor is proposing to come into the country on an unaccompanied basis, that the parents of the child or children um, are, are consenting to that occurring. And also that if that the child or children are staying in Australia, that the person or persons that they're staying with, that the arrangements for them in terms of their accommodation are suitable, and also that the person or persons that they're staying with are of good character as well. So it's all around making sure that it's, it's in the public interest that children should not be able to come into Australia um, without their parents' consent, and that giving the department the ability to refuse applications on that basis and also where the, the child or children were seeking to come in with persons that may be unscrupulous, for example, it gives the government the ability to stop that from ha happening as well. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess then I want to turn to public interest criterion 4013, and I also want to 
have a look at that in conjunction with sort of um, a sister requirement, if I can call it that, known as public interest criterion 4014. Now, these two are really interesting. Like in your practice, um, over the years, you will have clients coming to you saying, I'm subject to a bar, I'm subject to an exclusion. Um, what can I do to get around it? So like in most cases, what they're referring to is either public interest criterion 4013 or public interest criterion 4014. Now, the, the general belief um, among sort of clients in the general sense in my experience is that the bar is sort of universal regardless of the circumstances. So bars of this nature, and I'll talk about what the nature of them is in a second, is that if certain things have happened in the past in terms of someone's immigration history, well then um, these measures can be triggered and where they're triggered, it can prevent someone from being able to return to Australia for three years or for visas to be granted for a period of three years. But, you know, like all visas, whether or not the bar applies actually depends on what Schedule 2 says. So it's incorrect for that client to say that I'm, I'm subject to a bar. Um, you're only subject to a bar in terms of the new specific visa that you're intending to apply for in relation to these circumstances. So uh, I think it's important to note that distinction. Um, public interest criteria 4013 and the related 4014 um, will generally relate to temporary visa applications. So if you have someone <clears throat> that's liable to be subject to these arrangements, it's always important to see, is there another temporary option that might not contain the exclusions or is there a different permanent visa or a permanent visa that I can apply for that's not subject to them? Because I guess the easiest way of bypassing them is applying for something where they don't apply. Um, whether that's possible or not is another question, but it's certainly something that you need to be thinking about. Okay, so um, public interest criterion 4013, I'm gonna start with that one first. Um, Essentially, what this is, is a measure designed to capture um, former visa holders from being able to be granted certain visas for a period of three years following the cancellation of a previous visa. Okay, now <clears throat> for 013, when you come across it, it's important to read it forensically because it's not the case that every single type of cancellation event will cause 4013 to operate. It's only where 4013 prescribes it specifically. And as you look through 4003, you'll see that it specifically refers to the type of cancellation under what power in the act, <clears throat> under what specific breach of conditions, um, for what type of visa that the power is enlivened as such. So I, I guess, that's the first thing to note. And you know, how how could you deal with that? How could you foresee that from a client's point of view? Well, the very simple way of dealing with it is really asking the client, and this is going back to the importance of taking really good instructions, is that, have you ever had a visa cancelled? Okay, like in most cases, clients will be aware that they've had visa cancel cancellations because they're required to be provided with notice of that before and then given notice of that fact as well. Now, 4013 <clears throat> is important because um, where it applies, it can stand to prevent your client being granted a visa for a period of three years from the date of cancellation. Okay, so that's how it operates. Now, as much as it operates, there is the provision and the ability for the decision maker to waive its operation as well in circumstances where there's compelling and compassionate reasons that affect the interest of, of Australia or an Australian citizen. So if you have a situation that's affected by PIC 4000 and um, 13. It's still the case that you can get through it, but it is difficult in a general sense to get through it. Now, that's 4013. Um, you do need to be aware of 4014 as well, so it's a similar exclusionary measure. Um, it's a little bit different though in terms of its operation to 4013. You can have situations where they both apply, um, but 4014 doesn't actually kick in or crystallize until someone actually leaves Australia. So it's an arrangement where it operates from the moment that someone leaves Australia. So that if it's a three year exclusion period contained within 4014, well then time doesn't start running until the person leaves Australia as such. So if you have a client that's 
you know, sitting in front of you in your office in Melbourne or wherever it is, um, you know, the chances are that the time period hasn't started running for 4014 yet in that regard. It only applies when they leave as such. 4013 is different. It operates from the time of cancellation as such. Um, 4014 is generally created to prevent visas from being granted where a client is an unlawful non-citizen and has left Australia um, in that fashion or um, is a bridging visa holder and didn't apply for that bridging visa within a certain time period or has held multiple bridging visas. So it's a measure really to make, I guess, life difficult for someone that's in a situation where they've let themselves become unlawful and didn't leave Australia within a certain period of time. Essentially, it's a penalty measure um, to penalise persons who haven't, I guess, obeyed Australia's immigration laws. And I guess it's viewed to be in the public interest if that's the case. The, the important thing to note again, similar to 4013, is that where it applies, it can be waived. And it doesn't apply to all visas as such. So, um, if you have a situation where a client has been unlawful here for more than 28 days and they leave Australia and they're looking to come back in, you would definitely be looking to see um, what visas can I apply for that are not affected by this measure. And if the only way that I have of getting the client back into Australia is that I'm faced with a PIC 4014 arrangement, well then do I have scope to get through the waiver arrangement contained within 4014. In other words, are there compelling and compassionate circumstances that I can articulate on behalf of the client that meet the requirements, both from a legislative, <clears throat> excuse me, and a policy point of view as well. Okay, um, a, a big thing to note as well is that in terms of these measures, if you do obtain a waiver in relation to their operation, the time period will still run in terms of the operation of the exclusion or exclusions. So even if you get a waiver through within say 12 months, and the person then leaves subsequently, the time period will still run for that full three year period. So it's important to, I guess, advise the clients that even if they leave and seek to come back in due course, they may face the same argument in terms of the, the measure needing to be waived as such. Um, so it's really important, definitely going to the importance of, you know, questioning a client around their previous immigration history. And if it is adverse in terms of overstaying hugely important to understand how long they overstayed for and the reasons for it, because all of those considerations sort of get factored into the mix by the department in terms of particularly whether to exercise a waiver in the client's favor, you know, because, you know, sometimes, particularly at the moment in relation to COVID, like there's been situations where clients have been unable to leave due to no fault of their own, where there's been administrative error by the department, like those sort of things are looked at more favorably, but where, you know, someone disappears for, three months or six months, you know, those are more difficult situations to get across the line in terms of convincing the department to exercise a waiver as such. Okay, um, so moving on then from uh, 4014, um, I want to talk about really the next four measures. So when I say the next four measures, we have this one, which is 4015, 4016, 17, and 18. Now what this is, um, what these are, are essentially four measures that operate more or less together to prevent um, child abduction arrangements from occurring. So in other words, it's viewed to be in the public interest not to allow children be removed from their home jurisdiction and brought into Australia where it's unlawful for that to happen. Now, again, I'm sort of going back to this all the time, but it goes to the importance of taking really, really good client instructions in terms of this situation as well, because like definitely in my experience, this is something that you will come across. It's something that's really frequent. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around this measure's operation, um, but it is crucial to understand it because if you don't meet these requirements, there's no scope for the government to waive the requirements. And as you'll see, it can cause everyone's application to fail. So what it means is this, um, where there is a minor applicant, so in other words, an applicant under 18 years of age included in an application, the requirements essentially say that each parent who can lawfully determine where the child lives consents to the visa now being granted. So, you know, in, in most cases, you know, maybe 60, 70% of times at least, you will have 
an application group from the family where we have parents um, who, are, who are either biological or adopted. Um, and then we have children of that relationship or arrangement. And, and none of those situations are problematic because obviously each of the parents will consent to visas being granted to the children. Where we see it happening more and more is in terms of um, arrangements where there may be a child or children of one relationship um, and then a child or children of another relationship and essentially, I don't like the word, but a blended family type um, environment where um, there may be a child of a previous relationship that's lived with a group of parents for perhaps 10 years and now seeking to move to Australia. Um, so the way this is worded across the four requirements is that each parent who can lawfully determine where the child lives consents to the grant of the visa. Now, the difficulty may be that the second or the other parent on the new application might not be a person who can lawfully determine where the child lives. Um, so it might be that the previous or the biological parent who's not actually a part of this application may be that person. So in that type of situation, um, you may have to go and get a consent from that person signed to the visa being granted. Um, it, it can also be the case that um, that person cannot be traced um, or that person will refuse to give the consent. So what we have as a fallback measure within all of these requirements is that um, the, if, if consent is not forthcoming or required, then um, we would look at whether the law of the applicant's home country prevents or allows the removal. Um, so I think, you know, what we're getting into with these four requirements is essentially a consideration around the law or laws in different jurisdictions or in foreign jurisdictions. So one of the first considerations that you'll need to look at will be whether or not um, a biological parent is actually someone who could lawfully determine where the child lives. And that involves often a consideration in terms of parental responsibility, which is a whole like body of law on that in most jurisdictions as such and it's definitely not recommended for any Australian legal practitioner to be forming views on the law of parental responsibility for example in the United Kingdom or you know whether or not a country is a party to the Hague Convention and things like that so when we've come across it previously um, where there is an issue or a question mark about something like this um, we've always obtained advices from you know counsel in the United Kingdom or a law firm in a different jurisdiction don't rely on what the client tells you it's important to get someone that's qualified to give you that advice definitely don't google it because it just won't be accurate and to be honest with you i wouldn't give advice on a family law issue here and you definitely shouldn't be advising on a family law issue in a different jurisdiction if you're not admitted in that jurisdiction um and i guess then once you've done that and if you're satisfied that neither one nor the second way of satisfying it is, is able to be um, forthcoming or provided. Well, the only other way of satisfying this requirement is where we obtain an order from the courts in this jurisdiction that allows the child to live here. So um, it's, it's very rigid in terms of these requirements. It's designed that way. Um, it's important though that where we do have a blended family situation that you take instructions as to the party's ability to remove the child from that country lawfully, um, whether or not the other parent will consent to a visa being granted, um, or if, I guess, worst comes to worst, whether if they're in this country, an application can be made <clears throat> to the Federal Circuit Court or the Family Court in Australia. And we've had situations where we've had to work in tandem with family lawyers in terms of getting those orders to keep clients here. So definitely something to be aware of. It's always good to look at these things like all the public interest criteria before we get to an application and um, rather than it sort of blowing up down the track because you can imagine how this could easily blow up down the track where the question of a child who for example may have traveled as, as a family group on a visitor visa then brings a you know a permanent application in australia and it might not be known for two to three years so that is an issue then in terms of parental responsibility and consent in terms of visas being granted um, and then people have to go scrambling, looking for consents for parents that they might have not spoken to for 15 years. And it's a total nightmare. So I think it's better 
from a prudential point of view, from your perspective, to be asking these questions at the outset of any matter. Okay, um, so I guess moving on then from those four, I do then want to speak about this next one in some considerable detail because it is, I guess, writ large everywhere. Um, it's been with us for maybe again about four to five years. It has changed pretty substantially since it's been introduced. Um, essentially what it is, is public interest criterion 4020 is a measure inserted into Schedule 4 um, and will apply in most visa cases in Schedule 2. And what it's designed to do is to um, create a situation where if false or misleading information is given on a visa application or a bogus document is provided that a visa can be refused on that basis. Now, look, it was always the case that there was measures in terms of criminalizing that conduct contained within the act, but the insertion of this sort of more focuses the, apart the department's ability to um, make decisions on that basis, but also have certain consequences as a result. So in circumstances where we do get a refusal on these grounds, it is very, very significant in the sense that there is then exclusionary measures in terms of making further visa applications um, on that basis. So I guess in a general sense, it's really important <clears throat> for clients to provide correct information on any visa application. They're legally obliged to do so anyway. Um, it is equally important that they must not provide bogus documents on any visa application. Um, and the consequences for that to happen, for, for that happening are not only criminal, but also can be devastating in terms of a, a visa outcome for reasons which go to public interest criteria in 4020. So if you have a situation, um, and sometimes this comes up, or more often than not comes up post-application, where for example, um, I'll give you an example of one that I've come across really quite frequently, which is where a client goes off and makes a visa application by themselves, does not disclose the question of low-level offending on the visa application. The department then requests Australian Federal Police checks, and on those checks, needless to say, there's been low-level um, criminality engaged in by the client in terms of, you know, something simple like public order, um, nuisance-type matters. Now, if, if someone came to me with those matters, um, I would be saying to you that they would not be sufficiently um, negative enough to warrant an adverse finding under the character test, but because the person didn't disclose them, they've triggered the operation <clears throat> of public interest criteria in 4020. And what will happen in that regard to the department will send notice to the client saying that they believe that there may be um, a situation where incorrect information has been provided and they give the person the opportunity to respond and then you respond. But <clears throat> the, the way that it's worded is really interesting because um, for bogus documents, for example, bogus documents is specifically something that's defined in the Migration Act and it's very rigid and sort of arbitrary almost in terms of what's a bogus document and what's not. Um, with false and misleading information, um, it is also defined, but there's quite a lot of case law, judicial consideration around it, and it requires much more of an intention or a fraudulent intention to deceive in terms of the provision of that information rather than an inadvertence or a typographical error in an application. Uh, I do think though that because of, I guess, the significant implications of an adverse finding under PIC 4020 that it's important that you engage fully with a client to make sure that they fully understand that they need to take ownership of everything in an application. Um, where there is anything false, misleading in the application, it could cause the application to fail. Um, and where it fails on this ground, they, they can be then excluded for a number of years afterwards in terms of obtaining other visas. So it's really, really significant. And you know, needless to say, if you get a refusal on 4020 grounds, the department is, you know, forevermore really going to look at a further application from the person, <clears throat> you know, with a fine tooth comb to make sure that it's legitimate or to find reasons to sort of tip it out as such, you know. Okay, um, so I guess that's public interest criterion 4020. I mean, other than that, um, the main um, criterion that I want to talk about and to finish upon is public interest criteria 4021. <clears throat> 
Uh, this relates to a requirement for a visa applicant to have at the time of decision a valid passport. Um, now, you know, again, it might seem obvious, um, but, you know, time and time again, we see situations where clients bring visa applications, their passport is valid, um, but of course it expires from the time it's applied for, you know, a year and a half later um, when the department picks up the application. Now, they would come to us at that stage and say, well, what do I do with this? Um, and it's often the case with certain countries that you need to travel back to the home country in which to get a passport. So you can see, you know, like where something like this could be problematic. Now, there's a couple of ways of, of dealing with it. And I guess probably the easiest way is to tell the clients that, look, it's likely that this visa they take, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, three to six months to get a decision. It's important to make sure that you've got a valid passport at all times. Um, but, you know, sometimes applications can take several years and passports will naturally expire and it might not be possible or easy to renew them where someone isn't able to travel to do that. Um, so the way that the measure is worded is to allow someone a little bit of scope for wiggle room in circumstances where they've made reasonable efforts um, to obtain passports. But, you know, generally we would encourage everyone to do what they can in which to get a passport or replace one rather than run the risk on that. Um, I've had situations where we've had to apply for emergency travel passports as a means of satisfying that requirement um, or just to show that they've made efforts to do it because, you know, it, it, and particularly at the moment in terms of COVID, um, it's not easy. Um, in fact, it's almost impossible to travel overseas. Not every jurisdiction will allow a passport to be issued from the relevant embassy or high commission. So it's important to foresee something like that and be aware of the length of time it normally takes the department to make decisions. So you don't sort of have an issue when a passport expires down the track. But if you can't satisfy this requirement, the department has to refuse the application. So it's definitely something that's easily dealt with if you plan properly, but obviously could be a massive problem if you don't. Okay, so look, I guess that sort of concludes a sort of whistle-stop tour of the main criteria in um, Schedule 4 of the regulations. I think what's um, important to understand is as well that in Part 2 of Schedule 4, we do have a schedule which contains things like a value statement, code of conduct that's referred to in Part 1 of Schedule 4. I think the, the most important thing in part two of Schedule 4 to be aware of is there's a table in there which goes to the specific circumstances when public interest criterion 4013 is enlivened in terms of cancellations. It talks about what visas and what conditions in terms of breaches will cause it to be enlivened in certain circumstances. So definitely if you're looking at a client who's affected by 4013, you'd be reading 4013 itself in conjunction with what's at the table at the bottom of Schedule 4 in Part 2 as such. Okay, so look, hopefully that's been helpful for you in terms of giving you a general sense of what public interest criterion are, why they're there, and how the department uses them in terms of their assessment. Um, I think the key takeaway for me and what I'm really trying to get across to you is that the preparation and detailed instructions taking are really important. Um, for a lot of these things, it's sometimes not possible because the client is unaware that there are circumstances which can trigger the measure adversely. However, in most cases with decent questioning and upfront instructions being provided by a client, you can foresee outcomes. And I think that's important because even where there are issues with a lot of the requirements, you can still navigate through them. and. You know, where there are issues, um, you can be on the front foot then in terms of preparation of evidence. Um, you know, if it's the case that you know that you're going to have to make a health waiver arrangement, well then it's always good to have more time on your hands to be able to prepare something like that, you know, particularly in relation to the question of cost. So I think it goes to being forensic with your clients really from the outset in terms of understanding what the total landscape is going to be in terms of you know, potential issues in an application concerning someone's health or character or things like that. Okay, so look, thank you very much for um, listening into this today. I hope it's been helpful. As I said previously, um, the paper will be released to you directly. And if you do have any questions, um, don't hesitate to ask me after this session or by sending me through an email, which is on the front page of the paper itself. Thank you.